On today's Tech Support Tuesday, I'm going to show you how to choose the right router. Before we get started, on Tuesdays I release Tech Support Tuesday videos like this one here, and on Fridays I typically release either unboxing videos or more technical videos from mega nerds like me. So make sure you're subscribed and slap like to help hack that YouTube algorithm. Now let's get started. Now the first thing I want to talk about is speeds. And what a lot of times people just don't consider is what is the speed of their internet? And they focus more on the speed of their Wi-Fi and network. Now, if you don't end up copying files locally a whole bunch, it's kind of pointless to have a router that's faster than your network. So you could be over buying. Now there are some exceptions to this, and I'm going to go in a little bit more detail. Just don't jump around quite yet. Although I do have some chapters down below, watch the whole video first and then jump back if you missed anything as I was going over something quickly. So let's say you have 100 megabits down and 10 megabits up. Pretty much any router will be able to sustain those speeds. So the point being is to not go completely overkill and purchasing the highest end router when you will never see those speeds in your environment. Now you might be asking, so should I just be looking at Wi-Fi 5 devices and save some money because they're going to be cheaper? And I would actually say no to that. And there is a technical reason for that. So even though Wi-Fi 6 can provide higher speeds and throughput, how it does that is the maximum amount of streams is actually increased from eight to 12. And what this means is that you're going to have a higher data capacity. So think of it as being able to handle more concurrent connections more reliably. Now, the next thing I want to go over is the areas of coverage. Now, there's a ton of variables from the build materials of the walls and construction of the home or building or business, as well as how many square feet you're trying to cover and where you're going to be placing the Wi-Fi router at. Now, for example, let's use a coffee shop for an example or a restaurant. And if you look around, you're going to most likely not notice a consumer router just laying around somewhere, but yet they're going to have good Wi-Fi coverage if implemented correctly. Now, how they're going to do that is by using a Wi-Fi access point which is something like this here. Now, this kind of looks like a smoke detector and it's going to be stuck right on the ceiling. And the reason for that is because on the inside, you're going to have antennas here that are designed to be broadcasting the signal uh, outwards. So think of it as like a sprinkler, but with kind of like, if you had a bunch of lasers connected to it, be able to see where the signal is going to be going. And then of course, Wi-Fi gets absorbed and ricocheted off of everything. So it gets pretty complicated pretty quick. Now this is why in a larger building, you're going to see a lot of these all around. They're typically going to be using lower power settings so that they don't just blast and try to get the most amount of clients. And then they're basically trying to load balance the clients between multiple access points throughout the building. Now for your home, this is probably going to be overkill. You most likely we'll be able to get away with just using one or two of these if this is something that you decided to implement. But it will be more expensive than just a standard consumer router because it is just a access point and doesn't do any routing. So it's Wi-Fi only. Now, one other thing to consider is the length of ownership. This access point has been collecting dust for a while here because I have a newer one and I had this for maybe a year or so, but it just depends on your use case scenario. If you plan on upgrading your equipment every year or two, then it can be more expensive as a total cost of ownership to have a system like this. Now there may be an opportunity to rent or lease a system, and then you're going to have to kind of weigh out the pros and cons of that particular system against purchasing your own. Now typically if you purchase your own, you're going to have higher quality of hardware versus something that you rent from like your internet service provider. Also, you want to consider how long does a particular brand usually support their lineup of a particular product line. If brand X releases a new router every year and they seem to only give it three years worth of updates, then when is the router released that you're looking at purchasing? Because if it's already two years old and they typically only give you three years of updates, then you might want to avoid that particular router and look at something else. Now, for the majority of home consumers that don't want to have a high-end prosumer setup like Ubiquity, for example, I'm gonna go ahead and show you a simple website actually using Small Net Builder to be able to help filter and find a decent router for yourself. Now, if you come over to Small Net Builder, and I'll have the link down in the description below, we can 
go ahead and start filtering. Say for example, if we just want Wi-Fi 6, we can go ahead and filter that. And then let's say we want a 2.5 gig port, filter again. And you can see the uh, products that are listed here, it, it keeps uh, changing them. Now if we come back and I remove this and filter it again, you can see there are multiple pages here of routers to go ahead and look at that fit the following spec. Now let's scroll on down and for example if you want to use VLAN which is a virtual LAN so if you wanted to have separate security for example having surveillance cameras on its own virtual network while the rest of your network is on its own network and then another network for the internet of things then that is also something to consider as well as if it supports VLANs. So coming back down to here you can see these four support VLAN and there's only two pages of devices that actually support that. Now we'll go ahead and clear this filter and let's say for example you wanted Wi-Fi 6E and you can see there's only a handful of devices listed on this site that support Wi-Fi 6E. Now one thing to note is that with Wi-Fi 6E you do need a Wi-Fi 6E card to fully utilize the Wi-Fi 6E speeds. And again this is probably overkill for most people unless if you want to be able to transfer at near gigabit speeds over the air typically for local file transfers. Now I'm going to clear this again and I want to show you something here. So under the type see we got Wi-Fi 5, 6, and 6E. Notice that Wi-Fi 7 is not listed here yet. Now the reason for that is because well the hardware doesn't exist yet. The spec does but the hardware itself isn't planned on being released until around 2024. Now let's say for example you have either a larger home or a building that you need to cover and you still want to use consumer gear for whatever reason. Let's come on down here and tick mesh support filter for that and one other thing is for kind of future proofing security, let's go ahead and say WPA3 and filter again. And you can see that uh, ASUS and TP-Link come up with the top results. Now one other thing to consider, although not many uh, routers have it, is that the number of radios. And what I mean by that is that typically you're going to have what's called dual band. Now there are some routers that are called tri-band and what that means is typically you're going to have two separate radios for the 5 gigahertz spectrum. Now for most people this is kind of overkill and pointless but under certain uh, environments it can be beneficial. And what I mean by that is that you can have a single 5 gigahertz uh, band dedicated to say gaming systems. So then the only traffic that is going over that Wi-Fi SSID is just say like your Xbox and PlayStation and gaming laptop. Then have the other 5 gigahertz radio dedicated to just standard heavy traffic. So 4K streaming to TVs and other machines. Now the reason why I typically don't recommend this is because most consumers are not going to be aware how to properly configure channel spacing and channel width, thus creating additional interference on their own device. Now I will say that using ASUS myself personally, um, before I switched over to Ubiquiti, they do tend to support their products for a bit longer than most, and they also have what is called AI Mesh, which is a different firmware that you can load up on most of their models to be able to expand out the range of your network. So in other words, you buy a ASUS router now, and in a year or two you go ahead and upgrade, but the router you have now, let's say it only covers 80% of your house. or all of your house, but not your backyard where your pool's at, and you wanna have a wireless speaker out there to go ahead and stream like Pandora, and it doesn't quite reach or it's not reliable. So you go ahead and upgrade to a newer router, again from ASUS, and install the AI mesh firmware, and then what it does is it creates a five gigahertz backhaul between the routers. So then you have the single wireless network, you have your one that's cabled, let's say like in your utility room, or wherever you have the cable modem at. And then the other one, let's say you have it like in your kitchen and it's much closer to the proximity of your backyard. And all it needs is just power. It will go ahead and sync right up with your other ASUS router and become a mesh router. So then the Wi-Fi name is still the same and your devices will just roam seamlessly between them depending on the signal strength. So you will be able to cover, for example, like in your backyard, out by your pool, by just reusing your old hardware. Now, yes, you could do this with different brands, but it's not going to be a mesh network. You might have to create some kind of wireless repeater. And that also adds additional complexity, especially when trying to troubleshoot issues. So 
for Asus creating something like this. It just streamlines the process and adds a layer of simplicity for the end consumer. Now coming back to the Wi-Fi router finder, we can also see that Linksys and uh, some other brands also support some form of mesh. Now another thing to consider is how many machines do you plan on having connected to it over a physical wire? So we can see here the number of LAN ports is defined right here and four is typical, although there are some ones that have up to eight. Uh, otherwise, you would have to get a switch to be able to connect to your router to add additional ports for the network. Now, one thing you need to consider is that power surges can affect your devices and their lifespan. So it is always a good idea to use a decent surge protector or even a uninterruptible power supply or UPS. Having this in place can save the life of your equipment. Over the years, I've seen modems and routers both be destroyed because of surges in the power lines where everything on that particular circuit started to have weird issues that were unexplainable and everything ended up needing to be replaced. Now I've got a little bit of homework for you to be able to create the most reliable and performant network for your own environment. And what that is, is drop a comment down below what you're currently looking at purchasing as well as what kind of environment you're placing it in and the square footage and the build materials. And I'll do my best to go ahead and respond to you personally to let you know if I think that that is a decent fit for you or not, or if there's something else that you might want to consider. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.